dependent on what we were doing. And we supported the slicks yeah. in, in LZs before and after and stuff, prep the LZs and defoliation missions. Those are always exciting missions. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's about it. I probably just covered a thousand things in a couple <laughs> paragraphs, but I... <laughs> Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Welcome to one of our dedicated Pima Air and Space Museum interviews, and this one's a bit of a cracker, as we are joined by the fantastic Mike Kusick. Now, Mike's career has spanned oh, five decades now on helicopters, or whirly death machines as they're known in our house and Mike's story is quite remarkable. He joined the army during the 60s and ended up on Huey gunships, the fantastic UH-1H and he was down in the Delta for most of his time in Vietnam right through to the end of that conflict. He would stay in the army in the reserve flying Hueys for the Coast Guard and he would never really stop despite even being a policeman on the side. When the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq happened, he would find himself out there on the UH-60 Black Hawk, and he would be involved in a very famous rescue for a special ops mission that went horribly, horribly wrong. Mike is fantastic fun, and I really hope you enjoy what you're going to hear from our chat. We're even going to have a walk around of the Huey gunship that's on display at Hangar 1 at Pima. But there's a couple of things to throw in. First, we recorded this in the boss, Scott Marchand's office, and I think it's bugged because the microphone was picking up this weird clicking thing. It's not terrible, but it's there. I'm sorry. I always try to let you know when there's a little bit of audio quality issues. The other thing is, when we say Huey Gunship, we of course mean the UH-1, which is quite funny. When we say slick, that means the unarmed version of the Huey, which would have all the troops in the back. We don't necessarily say Black Hawk. We will be saying 60s because that's how Mike referred to the Black Hawks as well. There's a few other acronyms in there. And of course, SOL, you can figure out for yourself, but that does get mentioned once or twice. So we started at the beginning and asked Mike how it all started. Why did he end up in the army on Hueys? My parents were career military army. When I was born, my father was in Europe, and uh, so my mother uh, gathered up all the kids, and we went to Germany mm -hmm. to be with my dad. And I pretty much my whole life was spent moving from place to place, mostly in Europe and the Far East and stuff. And when I was a uh, freshman in high school, we moved back to Massachusetts. It's just a coincidence that. We went back to mm -hmm. Massachusetts, and uh, my father retired there, and I started a high school near Fort Devens, Massachusetts, and when he retired, we moved to another town, so I moved in my junior, my, excuse me, my freshman year of high school to uh, Groton, Massachusetts, and that's where I spent my high school years, and so that was probably the longest I was ever in one place was that three years of high school. And uh, when I got out of high school, my parents wanted me to go to college, and I didn't want to go to college. I pretty much hear that story everywhere a lot. I wanted to go into the military, mm -hmm. and I'd always wanted to get into the military. I always wanted to be a pilot. I always wanted to fly, of course. Yeah. You know, everybody wants that. And um, so I went to college to appease my parents, and my father said, go one semester, and if you don't like it, you can, you can go join the military. And I think he assumed that I would love being at a party college, Cape Cod, in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And, but all I could think I was joining the military. So I went one semester and then joined the military. We, we, had, to, we had to deal with that. And yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, wanted, I wanted to be a pilot, but the Air Force and the Marines and the Navy said, my eyes are too bad. And I didn't have enough education anyways. Mm -hmm. So the Army recruiter, my father said, join anything but the Army. So I went to the Army recruiter and he said, oh, we can make you a helicopter pilot. And I said, what's a helicopter? <laughs> <laughs> I want to be in a real plane. Yeah. 
And he said, trust me, you, you'll love it, it's great. So I said, okay, and I joined the Army and went to basic in Fort Dix, New Jersey. And then I went to Fort Rucker, Alabama, and I sat in the barracks for about two weeks, and all the other people that were with me were going off to the different places around the base, and they came and told me, your eyes are too bad, you can't be a helicopter pilot. And I said, well, and I got a signed contract, and they said, yeah, but we'll make you a crew chief. Hmm. At least you can sit in the back. And I said, why not? And then I sat in around for another week or so on KP duty, and uh, they came up and said, we have a deal for you, we'll send you to air traffic controller school. And I didn't know what that was, but my dad said, do it. Mm -hmm. And my older brother, who was an officer in the Air Force, said, do it. So I went to air traffic control school in Kiesler Air Force Base, and I really wasn't real fond of it. To me, it was boring yeah. you know, when you're 18 years old who wants to be an air traffic controller. But I went through the school, and I completed the school, and um, they sent, there was a class of 32, and they sent the first two in the alphabet to Anchorage, Alaska, and the other 30 to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go to Vietnam, and I was one of the two who got sent to Anchorage. And I tried to swap with somebody, but, you know, the military didn't just swap two people like yeah. that. So I went to Anchorage, and the day I got there, I asked for a transfer, and I spent six months in the tower at uh, Fort Richardson Army Base. And after six months, I got a transfer. I got sent to Vietnam as an air traffic controller. And when I got there in January of 1969, I went to a control tower and sat there, and I was bored to death. I absolutely hated it. I came just sitting there like an anchorage watching planes take off and land. People come from places and go, and I hated it. And I'm going to say I lasted a couple of weeks, and I just told them I quit and sent me back to the United States. I don't like this. And they said, you can't quit. It's the Army. And I says, you don't understand. I hate you, and I hate this job. And so we're going to teach you a lesson. We're going to send you over there to that unit make you a gunner. And I said, oh, no, no, please, please. And they sent me, and I loved it. <laughs> I, I, that's exactly what I wanted. So I started as a, trained as a gunner, and I, I actually, what they did initially was put me in the hangar. Mm -hmm. And I spent several months in the hangar doing various types of maintenance work and learned the job OJT. Yeah. And then they put me over and I, I got moved to a slick platoon uh, of UH-1Ds and mm -hmm. some Hs as a gunner. And I learned the job between the hangar and learning OJT job with my crew chief. I learned to be a crew chief. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people transitioned from gunners to crew chiefs if they wanted, and they, they had the ability and stuff. And that's what I did, and I spent uh, about six months as a crew chief in a slick platoon. What, what's a what's slick platoon? Uh, it's a, a platoon, it's a helicopter, and we had nine, two platoons of nine helicopters, mm -hmm. D models and some H models, that were mostly for troop transport and supplies, reconnaissance, mm -hmm. uh, missions like that. And that's what I did, and then uh, it's, oh, it was all in the Delta. I was in the 121st Aviation Associate Company in Sok Trang, Vietnam, mm -hmm. and it was the southernmost American aviation unit in Vietnam. And we worked worked almost almost exclusively with Arvin troops and uh, Mountain Yards Special Forces. Mm -hmm. Very little with real uh, large Army, U.S. Army units. And um, after about six months, I had the opportunity to go over to the gun company unit, which is what I really wanted. I mean, I liked the slicks, but mm. the guns was the ultimate. Yeah. So I uh, went over there and became a crew chief as a, um, on UH-1B helicopters mm -hmm. as, a gun, as a crew chief. And I spent six months there. And then uh, our unit disbanded in December of 1970. And I was set to go, come back. I extended for six months, mm -hmm. and I was set to uh, ETS in September of 70. And I, I would have extended again, except the unit was being disbanded. Mm -hmm. and to be perfectly honest, we were very close. Yeah. We were like brothers, you know. Nobody really wanted to be disbanded, but everybody was going to be sent somewhere different, so I just ETS and got out of the military. Okay. And, so what does a crew chief do? 
I suppose that's that's the next question. It's it's a name we know, but yeah, yeah what, what's what's the, what's the day job? What, what what do you get up to? Well, for one thing, I think I'm as a flying mechanic. Okay, and that's one of the issues the the mechanics part. And he sits behind the pilots. There, there's times where during test flights and stuff, he might be up front with one pilot. But generally, his job is behind the pilot. Mm -hmm. And in a UH-1 in Vietnam, your main job was the observation part and the weapons, mm -hmm. and to keep the weapons operating. And you had the various. We had, I'm going to say, six gunships at one time, and it was either the um, 50 calibers or uh, mini guns and or rockets mm -hmm. and then the crew chief and the gunner in the back had m60s and um, your main job was observation and keep the helicopter safe on the left and right mm -hmm. and um, keep the keep everything operating it was busy you yeah. know it was real crowded in the back of the aircraft there wasn't a lot of room in the bar green model with all the mini guns and all the ammunition and stuff and it was exciting it was fun i enjoyed it you know i um we did a lot of good missions in the slicks to where you go out in the boonies and work with the special forces and stuff. That was always fun, a little eerie sometimes because you could be gone somewhere and nobody know where you're at. And you never came back. Oh well, you yeah. Know, there's you never know. No would you never know where you're at. But with the guns, we worked mostly in twos or threes, mm -hmm. depending on what we were doing, and we supported the slicks yeah. when, in LZs before and after and stuff. Prep the LZs and. Defoliation missions, those are always exciting missions. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's about it. I probably just covered a thousand things in a couple <laughs> paragraphs, but I. But, um, a lot of maintenance stuff, mm -hmm. maintenance work before and after, getting it ready. And when you'd land in the afternoon or the evening, you'd be up there till midnight working on the aircraft, so I'd be ready the next day. Mm -hmm. But that's part of the job, and everybody, everybody worked together, the gunners stayed around after their guns were done to help out, and the pilot, not always the co-pilots, but you had a gunner, a pilot, and a crew chief on the same aircraft, mm -hmm. generally. And the pilot would, would stick around to help too, to help you at night. So it was a close-knit crew, you lived right next to the helicopters. Mm -hmm. So uh, your whole life was pretty much the helicopter, and your hooch there, you know, yeah. and the hangar. And, um, so you had to take care of it, so it took care of you, because it's... Right. They're very old. They they originally came to... Our unit came to Vietnam in around 1961, mm -hmm. and uh, they were uh, flying the CH-21s, mm -hmm. and then in 62 or 63, they transitioned to the B model, which was a troop carrier, but then became a gunship later on. But they were very old. I was there in 1969, 1970, and they were still the ones that were still flying were there and they were old and they had stress cracks everywhere and sometimes you'd have to bounce it off the ground to get get moving mm -hmm. you know but uh so if you took care of them they took care of you they i mean they didn't have a lot of power but they did the job yeah you know so what what, what, what with such an old helicopter like that what, what are you looking for when you when you're doing your checks on it because i suppose there's a you know same it would have a lot of wear and tear on it but it's like everything in the aviation industry, there's checklists for everything. Yeah. And you have checklists to go through when you start at one place on the aircraft and you go around the aircraft. And after a while, you obviously didn't need to look at the checklist, but it's there and you have to make sure you get everything done, just like the pilots have a checklist yeah. before they fly. And it's pretty much a standard routine. You'd watch for wear and tear. If something looked like it was wearing too much, you'd start watching it closer and maybe change it out. That's what you do at night is change the bearings, you mm -hmm. know. In uh, 25 hour, you change the oil, and at 50 hours, you have a 50 hour check and 100 hour check. Even in the regular civilian world, you still had the same routine to do mm -hmm. in the combat zone. Yeah. In fact, it was even more important, some stuff, because of the stress they went through. But, um, and you know, they, they, the aircraft were worn out, they were old. <laughs> they, they weren't dirty, but they were old looking. You know, they were worn. and, and uh, they did us well. We didn't have very many accidents that were mechanical, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, any time we had accidents, it was because somebody got shot down for yeah. some reason. And um, otherwise, they were good. They were good, dependable aircraft. They're good, dependable today, mm -hmm. you know. And um, when you're on the gunships and, and you're escorting in the slicks to, to an LZ, what sort of 
preparation to the LZ would you would you be doing? Because would, would they be holding off and you'd be going in first, or uh, would you all be going in together? But you'd be. Well, we go usually the gunships go in first, mm -hmm. and they, depending on what they expect, mm -hmm. they go in to see if there's bad guys in there, and try to root them out, try to get them to show themselves. Yes. And uh, a lot of times we'd have a, a flight of three, we'd have one or two down low mm -hmm. to draw fire, and then when they, they'd catch fire, the one above would come into that area. You'd, first thing you do, as soon as you hear the pop, pop of gunfire, you pop a smoke and throw it out. Mm -hmm. And then you coordinate somebody going to where that smoke, where it is from where the smoke was. Yep. Obviously you're past the point by the time the smoke hits. And we we could had had a lot of air support, mostly um, South Vietnamese Air Force would support us too. Mm -hmm. And we'd prep a location, see if we, see if there's how many bad guys, if they're really there. Um, most of the time, they wouldn't be smart enough to keep quiet, mm -hmm. at least in the Delta, to not show themselves. They'd show themselves, and we'd prep the area where they uh, were shooting at us, mm -hmm. and we'd bring out find an area to bring in there, the slicks in that was far enough away from that location, you know. In the Delta, it's, it's, it's a little harder to find concealment than it is up in north, the northern part of Vietnam. And uh, it's a lot of open area, but um, we'd prep the area, have them come in if, if it was possible, and if not, we'd have the, the Air Force come in and, and do their prep and bring them in, then we'd hang around. Depending on what they wanted, we, we'd hang around all day, we'll take shifts mm -hmm. to have air support for the troops on the ground. Or we'd park a distance away that's safe and sit there. Sometimes we'd sit there all day and wait. Okay. And nothing would happen. Other days they'd have us there all day, prepping areas in front of them because they'd be, uh, have so much resistance. But every day was different. Um, spent a lot of time sitting in little Vietnamese villages next to villages, waiting to be called. And before the rotor stops, you'd have 50 little kids gathered around your aircraft, you know. and. Uh, <laughs> they had their hands out for sweets yeah. <laughs> or gum, you know, <laughs> and stuff like that. And uh, that was always fun. But the people in the villages, they're always, what we, our experiences had, they were always nice to us, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, treated us very well. And uh, and the Vietnamese military was, that we dealt with was very nice. And we had Vietnamese pilots would come in and train with us, especially as time went on toward the end more and more yeah. Vietnamese pilots. In fact, they eventually took over mm -hmm. our aircraft after I had left yeah. for a couple months. And so they really owned the aircraft. And we just left people there as advisors. And um, I guess that's about it. So what, what, what did you do after that? You, said you returned to the States. And what happens to someone who, who, who comes home? And well, I did not want to be back in the States. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to stay there, but it just wasn't happening. So I, I, I was pretty depressed when I got home. And uh, I just sort of bummed around for six months. And then a friend told me about a job opening in the police department. He was a police officer as a dispatcher. And I figured uh, I got to do something in life. So I went to work for them. And I found out that cops were human beings. And I really liked all of them. I got along good with them. And I went to, started going to college for law enforcement. And so I worked as a dispatcher at night and went to college during the day and I got an associate's degree in law enforcement and but I couldn't get a job as a police officer there full time because of my eyes. Mm -hmm. And at that time in nineteen seventy one you had to have twenty twenty vision to be a police officer. Oh, right. All right. A full time officer. Yeah. You could part time the rest of your life. So I uh talked with the counselor at school and he said, Well how about and I, I wanted to get out of the East Coast. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd been to hot climates and cold climates, and I liked hot climates. <laughs> so he said, well, how about University of Arizona? We, we, we say that. It's freezing today. <laughs> well, yeah. I forgot my heavy jacket. <laughs> and I meant to bring it. I was hoping we weren't going to have to sit outside. But um, I came to Arizona as a student, mm -hmm. University of Arizona. And um, I started going around the local police departments. I, I had no intentions of being a cop. I wanted to get my bachelor's degree first. And I went around and did some interviews because that's people told me that if you want to do good at interviews, start taking them. Yeah. You know, auditions like an actor. Yeah. So I, uh, the first place I went to was the Pima County Sheriff's Department here. And I did an interview on Wednesday, and they called me on Friday and said, can you start Monday? 
<laughs> I said, what? And they said, yeah, somebody just dropped out, and you've got some experience back east. So I ran out and borrowed some money to buy the uniforms and all the equipment because you bought it all yourself at that point, mm. at that time. And I showed up Monday, and I basically, I, I guess I dropped out of school. I kept one class with astronomy because I liked it so much, and mm. I managed to be able to keep that class at night. But for all practical cases, I had dropped out, and I went to the academy and worked for the sheriff's department for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And um, at the same time, 10 years after I got out of the active duty, it was 1980, it was, um, I felt I needed something more. I don't know what it was, and mm -hmm. I saw a UE fly over one day, and so I mentioned that to a friend. He said, oh, that's the Army Guard unit in Phoenix. I said, they have UEs? I said, yeah. So I drove up there one day on my day off and talked to them, and they hired me. So I went in the Army National Guard in Phoenix, and I spent 10 years driving up there mm -hmm. And um, as a crew chief. When, again, I spent some time in the hangar, and eventually I became a crew chief in, on Dewey's. Mm -hmm. And um, some of them were so old. One of them was, did you ever read the book Chicken Hawk? Yeah. One of our helicopters was the Chicken Hawk helicopter. Really? Yes, it had the tail number and the bullet holes and the tail boom in the same place. That was pretty unique. People loved to fly that. But um, I was there for 10 years, and then they transitioned to 60s. Mm -hmm. And anybody who was within 10 years of possible retirement, they weren't going to send them to school. Yeah. So they told everybody, like my situation, you had to go find another job if you want to stay in the Guard. So I came down here and went to the 305th Rescue Squad in Davis Mountain, mm -hmm. and they had H3s. And I interviewed with them, and they hired me the next day mm -hmm. as a reservist. So I left the National Guard on Saturday and showed up Sunday here. And I spent 20 years with the reserves, mm -hmm. and they transitioned to 60s. Mm -hmm. And right when I got there, they were starting to transition. So I was in HH uh, 60s for 30, 20 years mm -hmm. with the reserves and then I had to retire because I aged out yep and um, but when I retired from the sheriff's department in 1990 I took a full-time job with the reserve unit as an air reserve technician mm -hmm. so I spent another 10 years as a reservist at night and then a technician during the day and then I aged out so I I had to leave the reserves but they, they rehired me the next day as a civil service mm -hmm. employee and I just did the paperwork yeah and I was mostly a paper pusher and I was in st uh, standardization and evaluation okay. the, the, most of the time, so I set, kept doing the paperwork side of that, testing, yeah. you know, and, and paperwork that nobody likes paperwork anywhere in the world, <laughs> you know. But when they get to be my age it, and you want to hang around aircraft, you've got to do what you've got to <laughs> do. So, so I uh, stayed around there another two years, and then my wife ordered me to retire, so I retired, and uh, then I joined the Coast Guard Auxiliary. Yeah. Just so, gave me something to do. So. What's the, after all those years with Hueys, what's it like transitioning to a black hawk? Um, it wasn't bad for me because it was bigger mm. than a Huey. Whereas everybody in the 305th Rescue hated it because they went from a big helicopter you could move around in and put a hot tub in there to this little tiny squatty thing that was ugly and didn't look like it would fly, period. <laughs> Aerodynamically, it was, how can that ever fly, you know? So th most of the people weren't happy with it, but they accepted it. Okay. Once they, a year or two in, when they saw how much power it had and what it could do, they got to like it, you know. And everybody loved it after a time. Because mm -hmm. it's a great helicopter, you know. It's terrific, and uh, they're just, you can't beat it. You, 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 as much as you can fit in there, you can pick it up, you know. Oh, yeah. And uh, er everybody pretty much liked it. It's still there. The helicopters that we got in 1992, I believe, are still there. They still have the same five of the six, and um, they're running great. You know, it lasts forever. Mm -hmm. They keep upgrading them. You know, in in the um, in the rescue units, you're you're working with the the power jumpers go, right. going and things. Though those operations always seem those missions always seem for for someone who's ever been in the military and is experienced at arm's length. That must require a lot of training to make sure that those guys are able to, to, to get and, and constantly and, yeah. every day. But you know the strange thing is, there's a little awakening. Everybody has this epiphany that they train and train and train, and when the real thing happens, you do the same thing you didn't train. And afterwards, you went, "It's the same thing I always do," <laughs> you know. And and that's how it was with with a lot of the people there, and 
you train and train and mostly we were special ops to begin with but after a couple of years they changed us to rescue mm -hmm. and in rescue there's not as much work you go and a lot of times you sit there yeah. and wait for somebody to crash and it doesn't happen that often but when it does happen and you go in and you do it and you get done you think wow, that was awesome but mm -hmm. i just did what i always do for training and we did a lot of search a lot of rescues and searches around southern arizona and california out in the pacific ocean mexico mm -hmm. with special permission we went down there and uh, but a lot of the people would say that wow, their first real rescue that was really really cool but i just did what i always do yeah and that that's how it was we did oh many rescues right here in the catalina mountains and the tortolina mountains people that were lost or injured you know and a lot of hoists and that type of thing fast ropes and hoists and litters and it's pretty cool it's fun you know it uh especially we had the civilian side too the yeah. civilian world otherwise it would have been boring most of the time even when we went to uh we spent a lot of deployments in turkey and um, kuwait and south america and venezuela and uh the unit goes to Africa now. They still deploy mm -hmm. every year, and it's fun to do that. There are different places, different things you get to do good for people, you know. And people like, we're called rescue, but we're rescue today, special ops tomorrow, medevac the day after, you know, ash and trash the day after that. But it's all fun, you know. Yeah. It's all semantics in the name of what you are and what you do. It's like any military aircraft, you know. What was life in the Coast Guard like? And I asked that because we're in. Tucson, Arizona right now, and you wouldn't think there's much opportunity for the, the Coast Guard in these parts. Well, my wife said I needed something to do to keep me busy. So she found the Coast Guard Auxiliary, okay. which, what the hell is the Coast Guard Auxiliary? It's a bunch of old guys that want, are wannabes, you know. But I said, yes, dear. So I went down to talk <laughs> with the Coast Guard people, and um, they hired me in the Coast Guard Auxiliary. And the Coast Guard Auxiliary, which when I was 21 years old, I would have laughed and said, I got better things to do. I can watch paint dry and have more excitement. But when you're sixties, <laughs> you, it's it's a little different. So I uh, I started working with them, learning, testing, and stuff. It's the same as the active duty military. You just don't get paid. Yeah. And most of the people are older people. And I would say seventy five percent of the people all have prior military, and fifty percent of those were Navy and Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. And so they they've been around the ocean most of their life, you know. And the only thing I ever had to do with ocean is we'd be uh, hoisting people out of the water and off of boats and stuff, but never really living on them or anything. But um, they have, we at the time, we were living in the summer in Cape Cod in the winter here. Mm -hmm. And they have a very, very extensive Coast Guard auxiliary units in Cape Cod all around the ocean. They supplement the active duty. And we were, you could be busy seven days a week if you wanted doing stuff that for the active duty. Yeah. And uh, we'd uh, take over the radio station. Their uh, radio is 24 hours a day. We'd supplement that for them. We had people who went and were the cooks when their cooks were gone. And uh, did a lot of water work where they would practice dropping people and supplies. And their fixed wings would drop rafts and generators and stuff. Mm -hmm. They'd practice dropping them near us. We'd pick them all up, drag them in, bring them in, put them in our truck, and drive them back to the the base, the Coast Guard base for them, but little stuff like that that, you know, when you're young and that's boring, you don't want to do it like paperwork, but I had a great time. You're a great time. And uh, here in Arizona, there's some very big lakes in northern Arizona, and there's Coast Guard uh, units at those lakes. Okay. And the people look, they don't realize it until they look close, but until they see the wards and stuff, that they're actually Coast Guard auxiliary boats. So I did a lot of work in Roosevelt and Lake Pleasant, Pleasant Northern Arizona. We go up, spend a weekend, and the boats. Most of the boats are private boats. Oh right, okay. Yeah, they're the yeah. people's private boats, and they get paid for gas. That's all. Mm -hmm. But they take their boats up there. We dress it up to look good for the Coast Guard, and we'd ride around, help people, tow people, in. and you know, thought they'd be drowning and stuff. But um, and a lot of people think we're cops. So they all of a sudden put the beers down and, 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 <laughs> and put their put their vests on real quick because they know they're supposed to have them on. But it, it was fun. You know, a lot of people really liked. They enjoyed what we did for them and stuff. And uh, I enjoyed that. And I was there until night. I was seventy, and which was four years ago. And, um, and then I, I, I retired. 
negative, but I got tired of being treated poorly by the administration, and so I, I just resigned from the Coast Guard Auxiliary, and, uh, and then the COVID came, and nobody did anything since then anyway, so, but um, I, I enjoyed my time there. I loved it. I loved the people. Mm -hmm. They were um, really dedicated, especially since they worked for free on their own time, yeah. you know, and so that was a very good organization, but I, I left that about four years ago, so. I'm framing this question carefully. How does a gentleman of stature and experience in years find himself in Afghanistan? We deployed there. Okay. The Air Force Reserve. Right. We got to, every year we did <clears throat> at least one or two deployments in a foreign country. Okay. And we did more deployments and flew more hours in our active duty squadron, 55th Rescue, that's right next mm -hmm. to us at Davis Mountain. Wow. And people don't realize that, you know. It, and, and we had probably 100, 120 full-time employees out here. Okay. And then several hundred reservists. Mm -hmm. So people don't realize a lot of them that the reserves companies work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we deployed to Afghanistan a couple times. And uh, had some exciting times. It was fun, you know. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, People couldn't believe that somebody my age was there. You know, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be walking around Kandahar and he'd be looking at me in a flight suit. What the hell is this? You know, <laughs> That's a, yeah, I got some strange looks, but you know, it's fun. And uh, I got along great with the people I work with. You know, most of them call me Gramps or Pops. You know, <laughs> but uh, but we enjoyed it. It was good. It was great to do something at that age. Yeah. You know, most people that might that age don't get to do that. How long were the deployments? Uh, well, the longest was six months. <laughs> and usually they tried to, um, I'm thinking that after 180 days, your status changes. And the pay status changes and active duty versus reservist change. So they get you out of there at 179 days. <clears throat> I think there was only one time we stayed longer than that. And a lot of it had to do with paperwork and, and technicalities and pay and yeah. retirement and stuff. And they didn't want to have to pay you too much after you retired. So, so we spent, I would say, an average of three or four months in different locations. The Kuwait, maybe three to four months. Okay. And um, South America and different places. But, and, and every time there was a, any kind of a hurricane disaster or something in America, we were there. Yeah. Other than the Coast Guard, usually is the first there, but and then the Army Guard from that local area. But then we show up yep. and, and assist and, um, and do we do a lot of good there. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections Andrew Bowley. Here we are at the Pima Air and Space Museum with one of our two uh, Sikorsky Dragonflies. The Dragonfly was one of the first helicopters to go into service with the U.S. military the Air Force, the Marines, and the Navy use them. This one was used by the Coast Guard. Um, it was the first helicopter used by the Coast Guard. They were heavily used to kind of set up doctrine for search and rescue for the Coast Guard. So a lot of what went forward with more modern and powerful helicopters after this was all stuff that they learned using the Dragonfly. Um, this one did do a, a stint on one of the Coast Guard icebreakers because um, they usually had helicopter support with those. It's interesting to take a look at these earlier helicopters that used World War II style piston engines, like this one had a Pratt & Whitney R98. So it limited a lot of the payload these types of helicopters could take. So it really was until you started having turbine engines and helicopters, like starting with helicopters like the Huey, that helicopters were actually able to start carrying larger amounts of troops and carry more equipment and more crew, weapons, etc. But this is one of the ones that started it all, like with the Bell and some of the other early helicopter designs. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. Well, folks, strap in and hold tight because I've got a podcast to tell you about that is as thrilling as a carrier landing in rough seas. So there I was. The hosts, 
Well, they're just a couple of old hands who've spent their fair share of time behind the stick of a Harrier. Yes, Hawker's second greatest aircraft. They're two former Marine pilots who know their stuff. Every week they bring in fellow aviators who've danced with the devil in the pale moonlight and lived to tell the tale. You'll hear stories that'll have your adrenaline pumping, as if you're on a combat sortie yourself. Take episode 57, for instance, where Gunny, a Vietnam helicopter pilot, describes how his squadron mate literally flew a helicopter blind after being shot in the face to get five wounded Marines to safety. He did so by listening to his non-pilot crew chief's guidance. Caution, Gunny goes from tragic to laugh out loud in this show. Be prepared to pull over to catch your breath if you're listening in the car. And if you're looking to show off your love for So There I Was, they've just dropped some cool merch that'll turn heads in the mess hall. T-shirts, beach towels, the works, all sporting the So There I Was logo to get conversations started faster than a jet off a catapult. So, ready to join the flight? Forget the trade tables and upright seats. This is about the thrill of aviation. Subscribe today at so there I was dot us. After all, as we pilots know, every great aviation story starts with so there I was. And now, back to the show. So while you were in Afghanistan, you you were involved in what became a pretty famous rescue. Oh. Um, I didn't know you even knew about that. Yes, it's um. It, yeah, we, we 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 don't have to dwell on it too much, but I'm I'm sure people would like to sort of hear your your side of it, your view of it from a as a crew chief on a, a rescue mission for a special ops team that found themselves in a bit of trouble. Well, if you want to know the real whole story, there's a our pilot Jeff Peterson, mm -hmm. Spanky, his nickname. He's written a lot about that. He spoke a lot about it at mm -hmm. the Air Force Museum, U.S. Air Force Museum. He's given some talks. He'll tell you everything from beginning to end because he's a good talker. <laughs> you know, he can rope you right in. It's like Chris Henry. Yeah. You know, he just mm -hmm. keep you there forever. But uh, it was fun. Uh, we were, again, I hate to keep repeating myself, but we were all very close. We knew each other here in Tucson. You know each other as, as a reservist or the National Guard. You also have a second job. Yeah. And um, when I was on the sheriff's department here, two of my people that worked for me were pilots in my guard unit. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. And so, like, I mean, there wasn't, I don't know if there was a boss or not, but I was the boss here and they were the boss there, that kind of thing. Yeah. So that's the relationship that people have. And you knew each other very well. You hung around and your families hung around. We'd go to, say, we went a lot of work in San Diego because you have to keep current on yeah. water work. And that's the closest place for water. The families would come along a lot of times, and they'd go out and sit on the beach and watch you flying off in the distance, yep. that kind of thing. And they'd go off and have a good time while you're working. So it was a close knit family. And uh, Spanky, I, I've known Spanky for years. He's an unbelievable pilot. Everybody in the crew, we knew each other well. Mm -hmm. We knew how you thought, you know. Yeah. You had certain routines and certain calls you made, and if something was wrong, you could tell. The, in their voice that something isn't right or something. So we pretty much, you know, it's like being brothers or sisters, you know each other so well. And uh, everybody did a great job on that mission. We had, we went out several, each day, we went out when it originally happened and started off by searching for the, the seals. And then another helicopter got shot down trying to go in there and killed a lot of soldiers. Because it was sort of very tight valleys yeah, yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. and um they, that we spent the time out there recovering the bodies and uh, hoisting them out and stuff and every second day you took turns flying and mm -hmm. whatever happened happened where the chips fell yeah and it just so happens that the chips fell for me on the day we were doing the mission mm -hmm. and we're all going yes <laughs> you know everybody else going oh it's my turn no it's not your turn now look at the list you know because everybody wanted wanted to go and um so Spanky and I and uh, the rest of the crew and the PJs. Yep. And uh, we had all trained. We trained here every day for this. D and did you have the same PJs or were they? Uh, the PJs rotated. Yeah. You didn't always have the same PJs. Mm -hmm. And their schedule wasn't necessarily every second day like ours was. Okay. 
and and we had crew rest issues that they're very strict on even in a combat zone they're really strict on crew rest and um, they set it up and we knew we, we tested for it. I mean we uh, tested what we could do in our limits and the altitudes and stuff and um, we it was set up really well with the, an army unit went in on the ground mm -hmm. and they couldn't reconnoiter the area and they made contact with the one seal Marcus Luttrell and we planned how to get in there and we went in at night very low it was pitch black we had A-10s above us and a C-130 gunship higher up and it was, thank God they were there they, they uh, really did a good job and stinking dark we went in it was pitch black everything worked out just perfect everybody in the crew was coordinated and you know in the last second little things happened and like a, a brown out you know yep. and you're on the edge of a cliff and the pilot didn't even realize he was on the edge of the cliff and I'm not going to tell him because he just did, per did exactly what he's told me he did it perfect and I don't know if I'll, well, I, I shouldn't say a lot of pilots wouldn't be able to do that we have a very good pilot Mm -hmm. with years of experience but I was just so impressed with Spanky and what he did you know and uh, everything went fine the PJs uh, went out and got uh, Marcus and this uh, other person that was with him that had been protecting him yep. an Afghan citizen and uh, we went out and everything went fine just like in the movies you know just like it's supposed to be we came in real quick quiet dark nobody could see us did it. We had night vision goggles, yeah. obviously, and uh, lifted off, and we're gone, and everything went perfect. So I couldn't ask for better, you know. Did you need to call in anything from the the A10s or the, um, the spooky? They had they had issues on the mountains because you were coming in, yeah. and they were suppressing the area. But uh, I don't know what problems we had. I don't think anybody even knew we were coming in. Oh, wow. they were so busy with the with probably the C130, the gunships, and the A10s that we just. Swooped in and got him and left. So, you know. per perfect talk. Right? Yeah, everything was just like it should have, you know. And uh, Spanky, contrary to the fact that he talks and says he was scared and stuff, he <laughs> he, was, he was perfect, <laughs> you know. I don't know why you say that. He did a great job. So uh, I really admire him and everybody out there. Mm -hmm. He did a great job, you know. I've, often, I've always wanted to ask this question to, to, to someone who... It's the job. It went in, it went well, training kicked in, you got the seal out, and it's great. Then you hear there's a movie coming. Did you see it, or...? Oh, yeah, I went and saw it. Yeah. Um, not right away, but I, I did go see it. And it was... It was okay. I mean, it, it was mo mostly it was the troops, yeah, the ground yeah. troops, you know. It wasn't a lot having to do with us, but that's okay. I mean, you know. It's all right. We did our job. Everything's fine. Did, did you like the actor? Because yeah, the, there's the crew chief, the two guys on on the back, getting a couple of shots. Did you did, did you think he he was, he was handsome <laughs> enough for you? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was good. I mean, you know, uh, in, uh, I always think that I had so little to do with things like that. Mm -hmm. Just a little part. I'm like a bit part, you know, like a little actor, you know. Yeah. That uh, I can't jump up and down and say that I'm the hero, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm Mark Wahlberg, you know. Because I just had so little to do with it. Yeah. Everybody had a little part to do with it. It all went together well, you know. So yeah, I thought it would be great. I'm glad. So, what keeps you occupied today? Besides coming into to Pima to chat to me, and if if it's all right with you, I might drag you out to have a look at the the, the gunship they've got in, in Hangar One. Sure. If we do a little walk around of that. Yeah, I don't know if you know this, but my this is just a coincidence. My Chris Henry, I got to know him mm. because my I got a call. I don't know, four or five years ago from uh, Light Horse Legacy. Mm -hmm. It's a company that rebuilds uh, Army helicopters okay. in Ari in northern Arizona. And they had done, they got themselves a junk helicopter. They found in a junkyard up in Pine Top, Arizona, I believe it was Pine Top. They researched it and found out just by coincidence that that was my helicopter, my gunship in Vietnam. Oh, wow. Which I thought had been destroyed mm -hmm. decades ago. And they rebuilt it up there. So I went up there with them and helped them a couple of times. And uh, I enjoyed it because I got grease on my fingers. <laughs> like a real mechanic, you know. And uh, had fun doing that. And they were trying to figure out what to do with it. So they started talking with Chris Henry. And he said, we'll take it. 
So they sent the helicopter to the EAA museum, mm -hmm. and it's there now on display. And they did a fabulous job restoring it. It's, and the, the display they have, there's all these really fancy, every kind of jet you can think of, and every kind of plane, and World War II fighters, and, and F-100s, and F-4s with bombs on them everywhere, all over the hangar and over in the corner. There's this beautiful display of this UH-1B gunship. And it displays all over the walls and, and like fit movies and stuff. And they did such a good job of this that he said people just come and gawk at it, mm -hmm. you know, that it's so great. And I went up there last summer, my wife and I, to see it. And, of course, he treated us like we're VIPs, mm -hmm. like he does everybody. And we were standing there looking at the helicopter. And who walks up? A family of Vietnamese the grandparents, the parents, and the little kids walk up and you look at each other and go, oh, this might not be good. <laughs> they loved it. Their kids got inside the helicopter. They were playing with the M60. They loved it. They had a great time. I was thinking, jeez, oh, that could have been bad. <laughs> but what are the odds, you know, that that would happen? But um, it's, it's there and it's really nice and that's where we're going to have our reunion and have a dinner in front of that. Oh, fantastic. And... Uh, and it's, uh, that's why he was there for our reunion last year, and he did a, a really awesome job. They did a fixing that up and painting it and stuff. Yeah, Chris told me about all, all the artifacts they've got around it as right. well, all, all, all the little bits and pieces. Yeah, and all kinds yeah. of stuff. Yeah. And, and my uh, pilot in Vietnam, mm -hmm. who happened to live here in Tucson, uh, donated his helmet to the aircraft, so it's hanging in the aircraft. And mine's already here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, uh, he passed away last January last year, so he's not around. But he, uh, so he really didn't get to see it. But a lot of the guys are going to like it when they see it. I think and, uh, it had my the original one had my nose cone on it. You could paint whatever you yep. wanted at one time, and they were gonna they did a nose cone for that. But I didn't think it was quite. I think it would alienate a lot of the company because that one particular aircraft and the gun, mm -hmm. the guns, that it wouldn't represent everybody. So they just put a nose cone of the company insignia, the Viking. Yeah, and uh, so that represents yeah. at least at, almost everybody. You know, it's and, not not too specific. But yeah, and then Chris Henry gave me the original nose cone. Oh, fantastic. He presented it to me at the Uruguay last year, which was totally unexpected. I was totally embarrassed. I just, uh, I, I'd rather sit in the background, you know. But it's really cool. It's a good way to Mrs. Jones. Mm -hmm. And um, I got it hanging in my garage. And, and fantastic. Of course, the ones here I had hanging in my garage for <laughs> decades. Yes. You know, yeah. and nobody wanted them. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, I came out and early 70s to try to give them this stuff and they didn't want it here because helicopters weren't here to war yeah. military <laughs> war weapons you know right. they, were, they were just transport stuff they yeah. didn't have anything to do with the real military so so I, I just kept them in my garage and eventually they took them and I gave them all my most of my pictures were slides mm -hmm. I was even get a slide film at the time and so I gave them all my slides and a little memory of stuff I had hanging around you know in the basement kind of thing yeah and um so, anyways, that that the helicopter and the EAA museum is pretty cool too. It's worth worth going for, you know. Yeah. And um, well, the one here is pretty good as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. there's another story about the weapon systems of the aircraft. Well, wh wh why don't we wander over and you can tell me that story? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> we'll turn this <laughs> <Yeah>. off. <laughs> 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 okay, so we've come over to Hangar One, and we're next to. A representation of one of your old birds. Mm -hmm. So, as crew chief, you're doing your walk around. What are you looking for as you head around the the, the gunship? Well, first thing you look for is bullet holes. That, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you can call the metal shop. Uh, you look anything that's broken off or stressed because they go through a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times you get damage from the shells from shooting the the M60s. Mm -hmm. The inside of the cabin would be full of M60 shells. And between that and the rockets, sometimes you'll get damage to the tail boom. you got to check the rotors real close, make sure nobody shot a hole through the rotors. And, uh, and then the engine, the transmission, the gears, etc. Just do a normal check for anything leaking, anything loose, anything out of place. You'd have to clean the filters every day. Okay. And at least once a day, sometimes during the day when you land, you had to clean them off because they got so full of sand. Yeah. You know, they'd fought out the engine. 
So you have to keep that uh, those real clean. And the, the oil filters and stuff, make sure they're not leaking. This this is a pretty cool helicopter because everything's out in the open. Yeah. You can open colleagues and see everything, and you don't have to really search for it. So if something's going wrong, you can see it real quick. So, so she's well designed. You, you can get at what you need to get at Very without well. too much messing yeah, about yeah. it. Yeah. And no computers, yeah. so no computer issues. <laughs> it's just mechanical, and it works. You know, it's a, it's a jet engine. It runs good. The transmission's good. It's well built. They haven't changed a lot, the helicopters, mm-hmm. over the, since the very first helicopter. You know, mm-hmm. if you look at the head on one of the first helicopters, Sikorsky's, they haven't changed that much, mm-hmm. you know, from the 1930s. So they're a good aircraft, and uh, it, it did its job, and, you know, it got old, like everything gets old, and they find a younger model, you know, like the 60. Yeah. 60's a good helicopter, and so it was time. The UE was in the right place at the right time, yeah. and uh, I think it had a lot to do with how the the military performed in Southeast Asia with the UE. And um, a lot better than a truck, I think, going in on a truck. But I talked to a lot of infantry people who said, get me on the ground. <laughs> I'd rather be on the ground where I can hide, you know, <laughs> than up here in these. But we loved it. We, we enjoyed it. We had a good time. So, the, I guess, yeah, b- besides the obvious difference between this and the slick, that yeah, the, the, gu- the guns mm-hmm. hang off the end, it wasn't intended to ever have these sorts of weapons packages on it, What was it? Uh, initially, no. Yeah. They did a lot of testing with them after the, the B, A and B models mm-hmm. came into existence to see what would happen and found out stateside that they worked quite well. Mm. And they had fixed wings doing a lot of that. And fixed wings can't just can't do what a helicopter can do. Yeah. And so they... Uh, that's why there's so much stress on them because it, they really weren't meant to mm. do that. But the weight isn't that bad because it's meant to carry five or six soldiers at 200 pounds mm. apiece. So it's uh, that way it's fine. But instead of the weight inside, the weight's outside on the frame, mm-hmm. and which they try to minimize, but you can only do so much. So, yeah, it put a lot of strain on them, and it wasn't meant to do it, but there's a lot of military aircraft that weren't meant to have guns initially, yeah. you know? And... Uh, the T-37s and T-38s and aircraft like that turned into uh, military warbirds. But um, it did well, and initially this was a troop carrier. Mm-hmm. It started as a slick. And then when they got the Ds and H models, the, the larger with the bigger engines, they made these into gunships because they found out it worked quite well. Okay. And it, it worked out perfect until uh, you know the Cobras came along and, and took over and a lot of Cobra pilots said they wish they had somebody on the back on the side, you know. Yeah. But, but the Marines kept them. The Marines yeah. still have these, the they, UEs, you yeah. know. Upgraded models, they don't. They call them something fancy now, but they're really just a UE. And uh, so they still use them. A lot of countries do. But. So, so the advantage of, of this is basically your job. You're, you're keeping lateral, yeah, lateral right, watch as well, right. making sure that there's nothing yeah. sneaking up on your res. Yeah, they had guns and rockets that could shoot to the front. Each one controlled a different one. Mm-hmm. But to the sides, or when you're flying past them, there's no protection yeah. other than the one behind you. But if you're the last one, you're SOL, yeah. you know. And so that's why that was, it was effective. And I'm, I'm sort of amazed they got rid of it, but more important, smarter people than me know what they're doing, you know. Uh, you like to hope so. <laughs> yeah, I like to hope so. <laughs> I don't know nowadays. I don't know if I can say that, but it's it's love. It's lovely to see it, and they've done an absolutely beautiful job with with this one here. Didn't and, they? And it's display, nice. Yeah. Um, did you say your your gears here? Is it on display or uh, over here? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go have a look and try not to bump into the sharp edges as we. Yeah. <laughs> I think this play here is, is awesome. Yeah. And this is, is it, it used to, I don't know if it works now, but. Uh, oh, they got the Kilgore surfboard. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It's when they have a skit from the movie. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, but I don't think it's. They might not have turned it on this morning. Yeah. yeah. I, thought, I thought there was a button to turn it on. I guess not. But that's cool. Yeah. People say, oh, that's fake and stuff. Well, yeah, but it's still cool. <laughs> it was still a fun movie to watch, you know. But they, these were my nose cones. Oh, right, okay. And that was the Viking I was talking about. Yeah. So we changed it to a Viking. And uh, we, when we were in the slicks, you could paint. You go through different company commanders, they have different ab- attitudes. Some wouldn't let you have anything but a Tiger with the aircraft number on it. And so they made me, they just get rid of our nose cones and repaint them to a Tiger. Mm-hmm. So 
this is what I painted it. Yeah. Uh, mostly because I was sort of an arrogant little asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, kiss my ass. I'm going to teach you a lesson. I painted it like this with the crossed eyes and the crooked teeth. And I put it on the aircraft, and I expected it to last five minutes. Instead, everybody loved it, and it stayed on there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, eventually, what happens was, I think most units have the same policy, is that if your aircraft crashes and the nose cone survives, the crew chief gets the nose cone. Oh, right, okay. So these two were mine, and I wrapped them up in brown paper, put my mother's ad, my dad's address, and... Six months later, it shows up at their house, unscathed. <laughs> you know, I, I couldn't believe they actually made it home. And then I did the same thing with my helmet. I, uh, they DX'd it and gave me the paperwork, and I mailed it home. So, uh, so I had those. For, I used to wear that riding a motorcycle to college, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was pretty cool. In least, yeah. you know. so you, the, what have you got on there? You've got Blue Diamond Devils of the Delta, and then yeah. an M2 on the side. Yeah, 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 and I, I don't remember what's on the other side. Probably a minigun. But, uh, there's the Viking on the top, and I don't know what's on the side, but I'd have to look and see. I don't remember. It's been so long. This is all just little stuff that we accumulate as a standard everyday map that we use. And we had uh, had a AK-47, but they wouldn't let me bring it home, so I just brought the bayonet home. <laughs> and uh, these are two high uh, money. This is North Vietnamese money that we... Uh, uh, came upon a, a sand pan full of people and we had a shootout with them and ended up getting backpacks full of money. Oh, wow. And the guy was a paymaster mm. for the North Vietnamese mm. and he was bringing pay to the people. Oh, right. So okay. yeah. we all took a handful of the pay yeah. and that's just for just for memorabilia, you know. Yeah. And there was two white leaflets that we we dropped in to the the VC. And this is uh, funny money, we called it. That's the money you used in Vietnam. Oh, right. And it was uh, MPC, it was called. So, Military Payment Certificates, I think. So instead of using $5, you used, and each one had a different military picture on it, submarine, a jet, a soldier and stuff. And I assume I probably got a bunch of that in my drawer at home. <laughs> but that's just the money we spent. And uh, this is a flag we captured. I got two of them in, off of VC one time, and I gave one to my best friend back home and I just kept this one in the basement for decades until they took it here yep and I uh, I tried to have a friend whose wife is Vietnamese translate that and it was kind of hard to understand but it it's a celebration of some sort the v- Vietnamese flag celebrating some event okay and I don't know exactly what it meant maybe somebody who's Vietnamese could translate it better but uh, so I just gave this all to them, figuring it's not doing any good in my garage, you know. And uh, stuff from that era is starting to disappear. So yeah, I hope they keep collecting stuff and talking about it. Not like World War II, where it's gone, you know. Yeah. How many World War II aircraft are there around, you know? Mm. Hardly any. Actual and, ones. Actual yeah. ones, yeah, yeah. Lot, lots of ones that are rather new. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, well, thanks for showing us around this, Mike. That's oh, so, there's something. So, oh, we got more over oh, here. These are my pictures. Oh, these. Are, oh, these yeah. are yours. Yeah. Okay. And uh, that's me in the bottom left. Ah. And that's just uh, one of our aircraft. This is what you do during the day sometimes. Yeah. You sit there. And that's what we're doing. We're just sitting next to a village, and that's from the picture from the gunship. And that looks like Brian Siplin to me. He was kind of short, <laughs> my pilot. And so just, you, you get to recognize them from behind. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a long story about that, too. <laughs> well, you can tell me that after we stop recording. <laughs> yeah, ask me about that after you turn the recorder off. I'll let you know. <laughs> Here's how we, we, whenever we'd go to an LZ, you'd have the, there's four aircraft, like rotor blade to rotor blade. Yeah. That's what you do when, you, when you're going in to cover each other. Ah, that's brilliant. Like a dashing young chap there. Oh, yes, yeah. I was. <laughs> but, uh, I've, got a, I've got a picture of me from probably 19, late 90s, standing next to a Blackhawk, just like that, loading the, the six, <laughs> the, I think it was a 50 caliber rounds yeah. around my shoulder. It's funny because there's different generations, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but still carrying a M60 or a 50 cal on, yeah, on the side of them. But, you know, it's the same as it was in World War II. Yeah. They, well, not the M60, but the 50 cal. They're still using 50 cal from then. Yeah. So that's the best, one of the best guns around, like a 45. 
you know, they're, they're still around, 1912, 1911s. So uh, sometimes the older is good. Okay. If it ain't broke. If it ain't broke, don't yeah. fix it. Yeah. There you go. Mike was fantastic fun to talk to and he really warmed up as we started going along. And I think you can hear when we get out to see the Huey gunship in Hangar 1, the affection he has for the aircraft. I was fortunate enough many years ago to fly in a 412, which is the two engined later variant of it. And they are just fantastic aircraft. And as much as we joke about whirly death machines on this pod, you can see it kept Mike going for goodness. 50 years on the Huey and the Blackhawk, and uh, he'd still be doing it now if his wife would let him. As always, I have to thank the fantastic team at the Pima Air and Space Museum for sponsoring the podcast and also for the support in setting up all of these interviews. There will be more coming. We've got some very, very interesting chats that again return us to Vietnam, but also the skies over Europe during the Second World War. As you may have heard in this episode, the ads are kicking in. So if you want to avoid them, our Patreon is there. It's You get them ad-free, nice and early. As soon as I get them all put together, they end up on the Patreon feed. That runs for about £3 a month plus VAT. But if you don't want to pay that, you're happy with the ads. Keep going here. The only thing I'd ask, leave me a review. Let me know how I'm going. Put some stars into your podcast app of choice. And of course, tell your friends as that is the best way to spread the word for the Damcasters. We're trending upwards, which is great. Everybody is saying yes at the moment, which gives me a nice problem for squeezing everyone in. And on that note, next week we're joined by the remarkable Dr. Philip Blood as we have one more look at Bomber. But this time we're going to be talking about being on the receiving end in Germany when we look at one of the test raids for Operation Gomorrah which was the bombing of Aachen on the night of July 13th, 1943. So please join us for that. Until then, you can check out So There I Was as well. It's a great pod. I didn't just throw that into the middle for, for giggles. It's a lot of fun. The boys are great. I'm hoping to have them on. But there we go. Plugs out of the way. Take care of yourselves. Until next week, thank you so much. Bye-bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.